I'm particularly thrilled and excited uh, to, to be here today. I would like to deeply thank uh, Julian Villabonarenas, uh, Kisha Prem, and also uh, Rosie Bernard for, for this invitation and Professor Graham Medley. I'm, um, um, let's say we have, I mean, your center has been of so much inspiration for our work this year. And, um, and, and so, it's a particular um, honor for me, and really, I'm really deeply grateful to be to be here today and to be able to discuss uh, uh, the work we did and then put it in perspective uh, uh, with uh, uh, with how this situation has changed uh, over over the last twelve months. Uh, before doing that, let me let me thank also the collaborators who are involved uh, in this work, um, and I think that as you as you did this uh, this afternoon, uh, giving space uh, to to younger and early career researchers, I think it's. Uh, um, it's really due uh, to, to, give, uh, to give space uh, and visibility to younger uh, researchers. And so I would like to acknowledge also the younger uh, students and postdocs and researchers who've been uh, really heavily involved uh, and committed to this, uh, um, uh, to, to this 2020 uh, year, let's say dedicated uh, to this pandemic. Uh, and, and, and of course, I'm not telling you anything new. These are people who have been working day and night, uh, weekends without knowing uh, uh, most of the time time, uh, let's say, um, holidays. And, and so I think that much of, uh, of uh, the work and what we were able to accomplish during uh, this year uh, is, uh, is needs to go back uh, to, to their uh, involvement and determination. Um, Let's say I, I usually use this slide uh, in order to, let's say, to present myself. Of course, this is nothing new, but in some ways, uh, those are uh, the tools and approaches uh, that we developed over the years uh, uh, in terms of mathematical and computational epidemiology, ranging from some classical approaches to uh, some of them uh, who are more instead in the need, uh, data hungry, so in the need of integrating additional data uh, nowadays coming from what is typically called digital epidemiology, so using mobility data, high resolution, uh, using also behavioral and health data coming from digital surveillance, and then in general it's a whole set of uh, uh, proxies that can help uh, in, into understanding uh, a specific epidemic situation and then to provide uh, some response to it. And one of my passion, and I would say that probably is one of my obsession, uh, is about space. I was, uh, uh, I, I mean, this, this sentence uh, resonated with me some, some time ago. And um, also given the fact that I've been working a lot on mobility data, I've, uh, I've been working quite a long time and in investing my research into understanding epidemic spreading into, into space. And so understanding all the nonlinear mechanisms, all the coupling mechanisms that space can provide and making somehow providing an additional layer to the description of, uh, of an epidemic. And so in other words, uh, uh, my obsession, if I need to characterize in terms of uh, what type of approaches and what type of uh, data is, uh, uh, is this one, matter population approach all lifelong and then mobility data associated to that. And when we were discussing with uh, Julian uh, about one year ago when we met at Epidemics, uh, uh, we thought it would be a good idea also to use this lecture to present some of my past work and then put it in perspective with the more, more recent results. And at that time, of course, it was December, so we had no idea what was going to happen. And uh, once we decided then to settle on, on this uh, later second date, um, I thought indeed that it was still a good idea to go back in time and then follow up take uh, Julian's uh, suggestion to, to, to present some of the previous work and then given the uh, COVID pandemic, this became even more important uh, in, into, I think, into the discussion of uh, how we should move on uh, from this pandemic in terms of response and in terms of our work. So clearly, if we think about uh, mobility and, uh, and spatial uh, uh, spread, uh, well, the, the very first application that comes to mind is uh, looking at importation. This is something uh, uh, that is, is quite straightforward. You have an emerging infectious disease, meaning you have a seed that is uh, 
possibly spreading the disease to other parts of the world. And this was a situation we specifically were witnessing, of course, in the month of January, February. Uh, so I would say from, from half of January on uh, that we were looking into that. And we have been doing this in the past. Uh, we have been working, uh, looking at importation for SARS retrospectively, but then we did that as in, in real time for the pandemic of 2009 for MERS and, and then and, and we used it also in order to understand what was the, the epidemic context or whether the epidemic was above or below threshold at the source and we used it then afterwards also for Ebola. So clearly the very our very first approach to COVID-19 pandemic was uh, well we do exactly the same thing. And, and these are rather, uh, rather simple uh, uh, statistical approaches in which you have an epidemic at the source, you characterize the epidemic at the source with the information you have on the incidence activity, maybe differentiated by region, uh, and then looking at air travel data, uh, connecting the source to the destination countries. Um, one of the big advantages that we have nowadays with respect to the work that we did in the past was that is that now some of these data can be accessed uh, in, in more recent times. So we have, and, and, and that has been changing, of course. Uh, we have been using outdated data at the very beginning, like 10 years ago for, for quite a long time. And then of course, uh, uh, updates, especially when the situation is evolving, like we will discuss in a second, uh, becomes even more important. And so the very first results that we provided were at the June, at, before the end of January, uh, the risk of importation measured in terms of breakdown probability, if you have one case imported to Europe, uh, what would be the probability for each country to receive that? And it was really the very early days. And by the time this, this was then submitted, and by the time we had a very quick revision, we had already two countries that, that declared the, the, their first importation. The, the data itself was showing that if you consider all the flights and considering, of course, also all possible connections, because we know that some countries had put travel bans directly to China, but then you can still, for example, land in Italy by connected throughout Europe. Um, and so taking into account all flights and all connections, uh, we identified these five countries at the highest risk, UK, France, Germany, Italy and Spain, which were also the ones which were hit before and then suffered uh, some of the larger uh, epidemic during the first wave. Um, clearly, the, the data allow you to get to a higher level of resolution, so it is also possible to look at airports which are uh, which are at, uh, which are more uh, targeted by possible importation. So this could be um, in case used for for increased control at airports. Now to note that, and, and this is one of, of the big challenges that that I personally witnessed throughout this year is also communication of this data. So it was coming out as a scientific paper. We communicated that to authorities uh, in advance. Uh, and in, in, let's say in the time frame of one to two months, this same map became uh, the, became an instrument, a political instrument to, to demonstrate that either the, the uh, health crisis was uh, well managed or it was not well managed at all. And, and, and the results of course were the same. So this is one additional, I think, part that is extremely difficult to, to, uh, to, to manage in real time, also communication to different parties and uh, actors. Uh, immediately after we looked into Africa uh, and, and there the, the interest was more into understanding uh, not only of course the risk of importation but also the level of preparedness that each country could have into, into responding. This was before the pandemic was declared and so before also uh, some of, uh, of the action that the WHO can, can put in place into, in order to better organize countries and better prepare countries that are in need could be uh, put, put could could, could start. And, and by so compiling this information and looking at two different indicators, one that is mainly on the, the capacity, public health capacity, and another one that is instead takes also into account a more, in a more complex and larger way, uh, economic and social uh, and political uh, um, situation of the country. Um, we realized that there were uh, countries at intermediate and moderate risk of importation having serious problems in their capacity. 
And so this, once again, could help us guiding uh, some of the preparedness and some of the action to improve uh, this, uh, this level. But probably one of the most important thing related to travel is that if travel is, is the mean for dissemination, spatial dissemination, that if we cut it or if we reduce and we act on the travel flows, then maybe this could be a measure for containment. And just to give you an idea, because nowadays everything is COVID, but if we go back in time, uh, we have witnessed uh, uh, serious uh, travel reductions even before for 2003 uh, SARS epidemic. Uh, the drop was, was uh, uh, substantial uh, in the air travel flows uh, to and from uh, heat countries. The same happened also during 2009 with about 50% reduction. And, and of course, what you see compared to what we are expecting now for COVID is that the quite it's not immediately, but with a very short time scale, then the flights went back to normality. Um, even if uh, in some cases, for example, the epidemic continued even beyond. And then more recently, there was the Ebola epidemic, West Africa the Ebola epidemic in the, in the summer 2014, when there we saw several countries in Africa and several airline companies that decided not to fly anymore to the affected area. And there was a major difference between these first two examples and Ebola. Ebola is more, was more similar somehow to what we saw during COVID pandemic in which there was a decision, there was a top-down decision either, either by national authorities or by airline companies that uh, prevented connection uh, to the affected area. While instead before uh, there were no, um, no travel restrictions imposed. And it was really just simply an adaptation of, of passengers who decided not, not to travel to the affected area anymore because of course of fear of the epidemic. So already in 2013, there was a first change into pushing, uh, let's say these travel restrictions to, to a different level. And what we know from uh, a, a large set of studies, and here I picked some of the ones that of course I like the most, uh, are, are telling us that travel reductions only lead to delays. The very, and here we're talking really about dated, uh, now, nowadays dated uh, papers. Uh, um, it was uh, in, in the period of pandemic flu preparedness in the 2000 uh, years in the, and so the first studies was, for example, Deirdre Hollingsworth, who after the experience of the SARS and the reductions observed there, um, asked uh, the question for pandemic flu. And then there was the paper by Cooper and collaborators uh, looking in a metapopulation model uh, and really tackling for the first time with simulations this, uh, this question about the international spread for pandemic flu. We did the same uh, around the same time and we were, um, well, somehow so disappointed by, by the results uh, that we put everything in the supplementary information. And so then for the in 2009 H1N1 pandemic, we were forced to do another paper just to show that, yes, we did that, but and we saw that it's not working and this is why it's not, let's say, in the book of, uh, of the measures. For Ebola epidemic, it was uh, somehow a bit different. So we, we did the, the study once again, and we saw that the traffic reduction led to delays that were measured in order of weeks. And, but there, there was somehow a need and a call uh, made by national and international organization and WHO in particular, who was calling for uh, the um, stopping these uh, travel restrictions imposed by authorities uh, because they were preventing also uh, shipping resources in terms of uh, medical resources, in terms of personnel, in terms of uh, medicines, etc. And so for COVID-19, of course, uh, this was uh, not anything new. And we, we looked into that as uh, several others group did. And the, in this case, we just built a model in which we differentiated between, uh, we looked at the first the 300 importations all over the world, uh, and they were coming mainly from China, but also from other countries in Southeast Asia, which, uh, which started to have uh, the first outbreaks. And so reconstructing uh, the, uh, the number of importation by date of travel, we could see that the travel ban had a clear cut of the importation, so exportation from China and other um, countries on Southeast Asia uh, towards the rest of the world. And so then with the model, we predicted that this could 
could have been a situation that was slightly uh, continuing along those same lines, but then very likely also some increase of cases as we saw uh, later on because of uh, the spread, the silent spread of, uh, of epidemics in several countries. And those importations uh, uh, highlighted there are mainly coming from Iran and Italy, who were the first two countries that then behaved as uh, important seeds for the rest of the world after China. Um, of course, other, other groups did the same. And, and for example, Samuel Clifford looked at that, also coupling with additional measures at the airport. Um, and overall, the result is always the same, that we get a delay. So the first thing is that if we look at how come, well, the, 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 the mechanism is, is pretty easy. We are looking at, we are trying to somehow use the travel restriction, which is a linear, um, uh, a linear let's say, intervention uh, in order to uh, counterbalance an exponential increase of cases. And so clearly what we're going to have is simply a, a, a delay that is logarithmically um, um, a function of, uh, of what we put in place. So we're not going beyond that. But at the same time, we could ask ourselves whether there is a threshold effect once we go down uh, in the in the travel flows because numerical studies, for example, were showing that you need, need it to go to up to more than 99% of travel restrictions in order to contain, for example, a pandemic flow. And then we dropped, of course, these as a measure because we never thought that this was going to be realistic. If we use metapopulation theory, uh, then it is possible and we build a network of uh, patches that could be, for example, cities connected by mobilities, and we pull, plug in some uh, realistic uh, um, information on how this network is organized, how this, what, what values these travel flows have, etc. Then we can solve analytically uh, the, uh, the, the, the threshold, and we realize that there exists uh, an invasion threshold that behaves at the patch level very similar to what uh, are not is for individuals. So it provides the number of uh, patches that for a given uh, uh, travel uh, system and for a given disease, it provides a number of patches that can be infected by a seed. And the most important part is that this threshold depends not only on mobility, so how many people are flying, that would be what we're going to act on when we reduce the travel, but it depends also on topology, so how this uh, network is organized. And in fact, indeed, if we go back to our reality and we look at this uh, phase transition between invasion and containment, uh, in terms of travel flows, what we realize is that if we plug in into that equation, the real values of our uh, air travel system, and for example, for a pandemic flow, we, we find that, that uh, we are completely into the invasion phase, and we would be in the containment phase if instead our air travel network was organized like a grid, uh, which of course we know very well that that is not the most convenient thing uh, to travel because we would need to do a lot of hops to go from one place to another on the earth. But these same structure organizing hubs, and this is a very common uh, and very well known uh, um, phenomenon in network theory uh, that when you have hubs, uh, then you have a very large um, reachability uh, in, in terms of your network. And of course, we as humans have uh, travelers, we have this uh, possibility to travel very easily around the world, but we're also giving uh, our, the viruses we carry with us uh, the same um, the same uh, possibility. And now the important thing is that how far are we from, from this threshold? And if you plug in the data, uh, we are about two orders of magnitude above the threshold. That is also why the numerical studies were showing that you need to go to a very, very large travel reduction in order to achieve containment. And this is also re the reason why about 10 years of research wrapped up into suggestions that feasible travel restrictions would not stop a pandemic. And indeed, this recommendation travel restriction is not, was not recommending in pandemic preparedness plans, not even by WHO. 
But then COVID happened and somehow what we thought was unthinkable and unrealistic, unfeasible travel restrictions actually happened. And we had the widespread travel bans. The first was China, but then following up in many other countries already from, from January, some countries decided to, right after China, decided to ban flights with China. And in, in other cases mocked somehow by other authorities because Again, they thought, well, this is uh, not going to help because, as we were saying, there is a linear reduction. And so you need to act locally at the source. But what if uh, these travel bans are complete? So it's a complete ban. 100 percent of the traffic is uh, is grounded. And what if at the same time we also put another unthinkable measure up to uh, January 2020, that is the use of lockdown. And this is not only for China, but it also happened across the world. And if you put these two elements together, I think that somehow we need to rethink uh, uh, what this, this body of research uh, that we contributed to as well uh, in, in, in terms of, uh, of, of disease spread and travel and restrictions that can be put in place somehow total travel bans were out of the game because they had a huge economic impact. But after uh, almost uh, 12, 12 months of COVID-19, we realized that we are very well familiar with the huge economic impacts also from uh, the rest of the management of this disease. And so this became somehow part of, of a new discussion on uh, how and why these travel restrictions and bans were put in place. And of course, lack of coordination also, uh, and lack of a common picture at a global level, a lack of coordination at a political level was uh, again, part of, of the problem. So once the epidemic is nicely installed uh, in European territory, uh, what we had to do was uh, to, to to prepare for, for, for the spread. And this, we started as, as many other, of course, groups in the world anticipating that even before the first cases and the first uh, propagation, local onward transmission was, uh, was declared, was found in the country. And again, once, bec again, because of my obsession, we were using uh, data uh, models uh, that integrate different types of layers of data, air travel fluxes on one side, commuting fluxes on the other, very high resolution, and here I'm just showing for France, of course, uh, also using contact matrices, but just differentiating probably with two different groups in order to simplify, but taking into account, for example, week, weekday and weekends, regular uh, school day or school holidays. So a, a lot of, uh, let's say, detail and complication. And then at some point realized, well, we didn't have really surveillance, good surveillance data to fit this model too. And and we were also lucky at some point, it was the end of February when we realized that, that it was possible to start seeing in some of the most affected region, uh, the circulation, likely circulation of COVID-19 in population through ILI surveillance. But this was definitely not good data, good enough in order to parameterize our model. And, and definitely we, we didn't have the time. And we know that time is one of the most precious elements when we when we react and we do response to an epidemic. But um, as Professor Medley was saying before, COVID-19 was an exceptional uh, example in this respect. The, the, the epidemics we, we, and, and pandemics we saw in the recent past uh, were fast. Of course, we thought, for example, 2009, H1N1 pandemic to be quite fast, but nothing compared to COVID-19 when we put it really down to earth and we, when we realized what was the time frame that we had at our disposals in order to provide some meaningful and useful information. So we had, uh, well, let's say to drop uh, the, this, this obsession and uh, goodbye metapopulation approach and welcome age stratified only, let me add only because we were very disappointed not to be able to uh, look at the spatial aspect approach. And of course, in retrospect, a lot of this was the only a possible move, but 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 if we think about the lockdown and how mobility has been restricted for several months, uh, the use of a spatial model didn't have uh, any 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 additional uh, let's say uh, value at that for that stage, and also in 
let's say one one of the one of the thing anyway that that was left is that probably there was a an underuse of mobility data uh, during the first phase. We understood a lot uh, from mobility and. We're, I'm going to show you some of the of the results that we had, but I think that the most important value of mobility was really in using that in order to be able to inform a content matrix, uh, and then at the end of the game, going back to the age stratified approach. So talking about data, big data, and any other possible uh, uh, type of data, well, I'm once again I'm trying to to let's say narrate this story from our French perspective, and I know that some of the, of the same experiences have been uh, shared by other countries, and in, in that in several in other cases this may be different. But what we had uh, it was at, in in France it was at the beginning of March. It was clear that there was an epidemic uh, spreading. We were looking at Italy, the Italian experience. Um, uh, authorities were were still um, had, had still had, had still somehow uh, uh, doubts uh, into into the um, capacity to have the same epidemic in France compared to what we were looking at in Italy, and at the same time we didn't have good data good surveillance data to look at. So the, the, the ILI surveillance was the type I was showing you before. And, and at that point, it was clear that we needed uh, uh, hospital admission data. And there you realize that on one side, we've been talking about big data for about 10 years. And we've been building uh, so much into uh, digital approaches. Uh, uh, and, and somehow probably we forgot uh, about the importance uh, of uh, lower um, lower size but high quality data uh, that is nicely contextualized. So what is generally called small and thick data. To give you an example, in France, uh, the there was no database infrastructure for hospital admission at national level, and this was then adapted from an existing um, infrastructure that was created in 2015 for the terrorist attacks. And it was probably only because of that reason that in about less than one month, so from mid mid February to early March, it was possible to use that database, and then this became operational just a few days before France entered into lockdown, and so had to fill in the data retrospectively with all the possible problems of memory notification that you can uh, imagine. Uh, at the same time, we had serious trouble into just understanding how many ICU beds there were in the countries and possibly by region. And if we were, you were going to look into um, EC data, for example, uh, it was impossible to find anything. And the most recent uh, uh, data set was published in Intensive Care Medical Journal in 2012. And, and so it was eight years old with the many, many countries that underwent strong hospital organization in the last few years. Um, once again, in, in some countries, for example, colleagues told me that these data were hostage of specific uh, ministries or in silos that couldn't be shared across, uh, uh, across ministries or let alone uh, to the scientific community. So I think we really, uh, this was somehow a shocking realization uh, that working with so much data, then we forgot about something that was very easy as, as a simple Excel file of few lines, uh, static, moreover, not even evolving. Um, the second aspect was uh, that we didn't have, uh, so lockdown was implemented and uh, we didn't have uh, contact data. We didn't have a study as you did in the UK that could al allow us to understand how contacts were reduced during lockdown. And so we had to uh, mechanistically modify the, the contact metrics uh, uh, by itself. Um, and, and so some of the choices, of course, were quite natural, school closure, um, closure of non-essential activities, everything was closed, uh, case isolation following uh, testing, we didn't put it because uh, France was not testing, uh, barely testing, uh, only people who were going to the hospital. But one, we, for example, we made an assumption on physical contacts that they were not 
happening outside the home. But one of the most important uh, aspect was how many people are staying at home instead of going to work. And, and we didn't have any idea of that. And even the, the, the statistics and, uh, and all the proxies that you could have weren't telling us uh, a lot. And so in that case, we used mobility data. So the first use of mobility data, high resolution, uh, daily by age bracket, uh, um, high spatial resolution uh, was to serve uh, the purpose of uh, uh, creating and so parameterizing uh, a content matrix. And why did we want to do that? Well, it was almost, we wanted to provide information uh, after four weeks of implementation of, uh, of the lockdown. And after three weeks, uh, that was the situation that you see in this data. Uh, so you clearly see that the epidemic uh, is low down. You clearly see that likely it R is equal, almost equal to one, probably going down. But then there is a cloud of po data points uh, and there is no clear tendency for afterwards for the descent. And we didn't want to wait any further because authorities wanted to provide, to communicate to the public about a plan of the possible weeks, uh, four weeks after the implementation of the lockdown. And so we, we used mobility data to inform our, our metrics and to provide um, information on, on the expected impact on lockdown. And mobility data is really, truly, so next to contact data, which became the compass, uh, I, I think that the paper by Kisha Prem really became the compass for about 200 countries in the world uh, in, in guiding their, um, the, the management of their health crisis. And next to contact data, uh, it, in terms of big data, Mobility was really uh, the other superstar data set. Um, this is not new. Uh, mobility, let's say, for example, mobility data coming from cell phone data has been used for the last probably decade uh, in several projects, which are called the generally social good project, not only epidemics, but also earthquake, tsunami, etc. cetera. Um, and at the beginning of the year, several editorials came out uh, uh, showing and, and calling for the use of this data. And I think that in this direction, uh, we had uh, probably in the opening of data sets, we had the largest uh, performance uh, and we had the, the, the widest uh, availability because not only telephone communication were more willing to share their data with the scientific communities, but companies went far beyond that. And so Facebook and Google provided these data sets, some of them are, to some level of aggregation publicly available, some others through, uh, of course, agreements and projects uh, if, uh, at high, if higher resolution was needed. And, and this data has been, and is, is being used currently as a, an important mean of information of what is, what is happening. And to give you an idea of, of what happened in, in France, so we used, we started this collaboration, it was generally, I had an ongoing collaboration for, uh, with Orange for um, Ebola epidemic in Africa. And so we decided, well, let's use uh, uh, the data for, uh, for France because clearly that there, if we want, and again, this was based on my obsession, we want to do a meta population model, likely, the behavior of people will change. And so we need good data on how to track this change of behavior in mobility. Um, and then even, in, in, even we, we didn't use that for a spatial model. Uh, we characterize mobility across uh, time. We looked, uh, we found a very large reduction of mobility was about 60 to 70%. Uh, interesting, in, from an interesting point of view, we didn't see a lot of difference across age classes, um, especially for all, uh, all possible displacements. Um, and then something else, geography, geography matters, uh, the type of uh, range of uh, connectedness that this network of mobility has on the long, on before and after lockdown was implemented completely changed and shrinked, of course, for all of the cities, uh, major cities, but some cities shrinked much more than, than others. And anyway, keeping long range connection that are the ones which are important to, to then keep the network aggregated. Um, and and I, I think that uh, Amish uh, was, was presenting these uh, similar results before uh, today from Facebook data. Then one thing that we looked at was, uh, was something that we found extremely interesting. So we, we looked at, we found the regional heterogeneities in how much 
mobility was reduced. And so we thought immediately we thought, well, this is adoption. This is must be a response of people, but there are actually some rigid constraints. And these constraints are imposed by the age profile, how many people are in the active uh, population age range. So going to work. Uh, they are also depending on socioeconomic uh, indicators. We know that essential workers are the only ones who were allowed to go to work. And so this is also the reason uh, why they were they 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 could move, and so the the, the level uh, socioeconomic level differs by by region, um, and then of course the workers who are mostly impacted by, uh, by, by the lockdown rules. So imagine everything that is related to entertainment and tourism. Uh, and, and there are some regions who are mostly uh, investing in these in this, in this sectors, economic sectors. And so those were the most impacted. Then we also found a behavioral component that we interpreted in terms of risk aversion. Of course, we, we, this was still an ecological study, so we're not sure about the cause effect but what we found is that the regions which were mostly hit by the first wave, which were few, were also the ones showing um, a larger reduction in, uh, in mobility. Luckily, because it was a novelty, uh, lockdown was uh, very suddenly implemented in France. Um, two days before, it was not mentioned. Actually, it was almost uh, taken out of the possibilities. And then two days after, this was implemented nationwide. So there was a certain attention to the problem. And then also, it was the first time that these numbers of hospitalization, uh, people in ICU and baths were counting and piling up uh, so uh, dramatically. The interesting part is that for everything concerning socioeconomic indicators and especially the, the um, sectors which are um, which are considered by the regulations surrounding the lockdown are also valid nowadays. We're currently, France is currently still in a second lockdown. It's nationwide. It was implemented at the end of October. And though we see a, about half the reduction that we saw during the first wave, we still see these regional heterogeneities and we still see that this depends on some of these rigid constraints. And why is this important? Because every time that such a measure is implemented, of course, we, we imagine that there is a certain fatigue and so it will need to be more and more open. And depending on what sectors are allowed to be open, then you will also have some differences in the mobility and then, of course, an impact on the epidemic. And so what impact? Well, we used this regional uh, reduction of mobility exactly to inform how many adults were staying at home, either because uh, they were teleworking or because their uh, work was closed before, because of lockdown. And so once again, we go back to, to, to the situation of, uh, of the lockdown. And what we wanted to do was to uh, implement this uh, supposed contact metrics and see, uh, evaluate the expected impact. And then retrospectively, here I'm showing the projections uh, that we had and also comparing uh, on the left, uh, the lockdown, uh, expected lockdown, there was the red line and then the one that we fitted uh, retrospectively on the data. Um, the projections was, were, were also good in, in tracing and uh, tracking the uh, epidemic trajectory in the ICU and the number of beds occupied, a bit overestimating, but uh, this is applied to Ile-de-France and it was one of the largest hit regions. And given that the other regions in the country didn't have such a large epidemic, a lot of patients also were moved and transferred from Ile-de-France to the rest uh, of the country. Now, some of the, of the interesting stuff was that we assumed that physical contacts were avoided outside the home. And this was then later confirmed by surveys that were uh, periodically run by the National Health Agency. And then also we, we took the pleasure of comparing what how our uh, synthetic contact metrics uh, during lockdown uh, compared with what was measured uh, and available at that time in China and in the in the UK. Uh, so this was the the uh, we we used the, the the results that were in the preprint uh, by Christopher Jarvis and collaborators, uh, and so 
putting that reduction within the situation that we were seeing in France, we would have obtained a much stronger reduction and much faster reduction if we used the lockdown implemented in China. And then, of course, we all very well know that uh, reduction, that restrictions were, were, were much stricter than what we implemented in Europe. And we realized that in our case, our estimation for the reduction of contacts uh, was larger than what uh, uh, measured uh, in the UK. And so in the case of the UK, R was still below one, but, but uh, was uh, um, requiring a longer time frame to reach the peak and then slowly go, going down. And then the phase number three arrived, uh, and, and this, uh, at least in our country, this was uh, called as leading with the virus. And there were some, of, some aspects of that were known somehow, uh, of course, test, trace, and isolate, but there was also a very strong need and push uh, to to go into a situation, to exit this, this very heavy situation and, and try somehow uh, to forget. So some of the items that I'm listing here are the ones that became of, of central interest during that time frame. The schools, uh, we, when we did the work on, uh, on lockdown, uh, we assumed that we also looked at possible exit strategies, but we assumed that schools remain closed because some of the countries who were already exiting from lockdown, for example, Italy and Spain, kept them closed. And then the announcement by, by President Macron um, showed that instead the intention was different, was to open the schools already in early May for the last two months of the school session. Then, of course, was the problem of mobility restrictions. Shall we keep some level of mobility restriction within the country? What, what is going to happen during the summer? Um, compliance fatigue, we, we didn't have data yet on the use of preventive measures, but this would come then later on. And clearly, we accumulated over time, especially uh, after the summer, an increasing fatigue. Uh, and then all of, uh, all of the importance and the narrative was about this test trace and isolate system. And then I, I'm writing all over again in the sense that when we, and it was summer and, uh, and, and all of, uh, of, of the problems somehow that we encountered also um, very basically in the, in the communication of what uh, we could expect, um, all of those problems and challenges uh, were still there, even during at the start of the second wave, even when the cases started to increasing exactly in the same way we witnessed the, the first wave. So just very briefly in terms of school reopening, because I think I wanted to put this slide because I think it goes nicely in relation to what um, James uh, presented before. Uh, it is a different approach, uh, less, less innovative, definitely. Uh, we were looking uh, once again uh, with the, the age stratified model, uh, exiting from this lockdown. Um, it, it, first, uh, it was, we did this work uh, still in, in the lockdown. So first of all, we didn't know how we were gonna exit. So we assumed that we, we had an effective R about one with school closed so that we put ourselves in a very conservative uh, situation. And then we looked at possibilities, uh, what we could expect with the schools closed. And there were a lot of uncertainties at that time. We knew uh, from one of your paper, uh, from uh, Rosalind Eggo's paper, that there was an age-specific susceptibility, so we took that into account. And there were some preliminary, preliminary evidence from uh, serological studies conducted in the very first large outbreak uh, in France, uh, showing that teenagers very likely behaved as uh, asymptomatic adults, so one instead for uh, younger children, we could they, they were expecting to be less contagious. But we didn't know how, we didn't know whether this evidence was uh, uh, stable and robust enough. So what we did was to explore completely uh, a relative transmissibility of younger children uh, and then look at whether we could have protocols that could allow safely, even within this uncertainty, to reopen schools, which was the, the desire of, of the government. And, and we looked at three different possibilities. So the first one in which only pre-primary school and primary school would reopen on May 11, which was the date uh, used, uh, decided for the for lifting the lockdown. A second uh, uh, possibility to have a middle and high school reopen one month after. There was a total of uh, two months uh, of school in session before uh, summer holidays. And then um, instead to reopen all schools level together. And of course we could do that either uh, suddenly, so everybody goes to school uh, 100 
100% of students go to school uh, at the immediate reopening or progressively over time, keeping attendance limited, for example, to 50%. What we found is that given the uncertainty, the safest option would be to keep uh, high, middle and high schools uh, uh, closed or to reopen them only later. And what really happened uh, was that the, our uh, scenario of uh, our effective around one was quite conservative. And despite very poor detection, uh, there was a large avoidance of physical contacts uh, that we didn't consider in our preliminary scenario. And indeed, if we fit then the exit from the first lockdown with the schools open, uh, schools were open, but uh, the government this, given a large uh, uh, um, complaints by uh, by teachers and also by parents. Uh, the schools were open, but only on a voluntary basis, and only very few people about from. 10% to 20% of students went back to school after all. So uh, opening was not as major as uh, expected. And indeed the difference between a school closed scenario that would be the blue and a school, uh, sorry, the orange and a school open scenario with this attendance is, uh, is quite minor. Um, and this was thanks to the fact that a large uh, number of physical contacts were avoided and our feed provides about 80% of contacts uh, uh, to be avoided. And this is in line with then uh, surveys uh, uh, conducting the population. Now the need to test test trees that isolate. Of course, now it's uh, completely clear. There are so many uh, papers and evidence suggesting that. And in, in order to put that into frame, this came out as, as an important need to get out, to lift the very first lockdown. Um, and, and we were showing that if we were going to, um, to progressively relax some of the restrictive measures, uh, even in presence of additional uh, preventive measures adopted by individuals, so still we would need to detect at least one out of two cases. Otherwise we would have a rebound of the epidemic for a second wave. And now we'll know that these are scenario analysis, these are not predictions, but these are still meant to provide what could still possible is possible that what could be still possible in terms of events that could happen in the future and somehow the whole summer uh, put a, a, a let let uh, let us forget some of uh, of this or let authorities forget some of this information that were already available in mid april and if you look retrospectively in time and we put just simply drop the data on top of this scenario that was very early we see that somehow this is at the end of what happened of course the situation was much uh, uh, is much more complicated than that but but once again, this was a, an analysis that should have led uh, preparation into, uh, in, in, into a possible second wave in the winter time. And so what happened, and I'd like to conclude on this point, I know that um, we discussed under detection already uh, uh, in, in previously during the other session. Uh, it was uh, Tim Russell who presented your work on uh, looking at a large number of, of countries. Um, what we look specifically at the phase after the first lockdown. Uh, why? Because this was the moment in which test trace and isolate was supposed to be the key to exit. And so it was supposed to be systematically um, tracing all uh, symptomatic cases and then tracing uh, uh, identifying all symptomatic cases and then tracing their contact. So we looked at virological surveillance. We had a highly detailed virological surveillance for the country at individual level, telling also us what was the delay from onset to testing. Uh, and then we parameterized the model in a different way. This time we looked at Google data in order to inform the presence at workplace. And you can see that after the lockdown, there was a, a rebound of people going back to work with the exception of the Paris region that had a similar trend, but remained always very low compared to the other regions for, for many reasons, among which telework and also entertainment sector that was still closed. Then we parameterized it with the uh, presence at school from Ministry of Education data. Um, we looked also at how many people were avoiding physical contacts and this changed over time. And of course it was reduced over time was relaxed because people relaxed their measure, uh, but still seniors had a, a larger probability of uh, uh, reducing, of maintaining these contacts compared to 
the other age classes. So we parameterized the model in this way. Then we validated over, well, this was after the first revision actually, because serological data in France arrived quite late after summer, but at the end we had three different serological studies uh, on different uh, um, sample of the population and we were able then so to, to validate our model on, uh, to that at national and regional basis. Um, and what we found was a, a striking under detection. Of course, it's we were expecting a very a really strong under detection during the, for the early phase, which was mainly what what Tim was was talking about. And we knew that France was was not testing enough during the first wave and during also the time in which we were under lockdown. But the uh, the actual aim of this system was to be able to track infections when we were going out. And in that what we instead what we found is that the detection rate ranged from 7% to 40%. Capacity increased over time, so detection increased over time. On one time, on one side, for sure because of capacity increasing, but also because the epidemic was nonetheless going down because of summer, because of adoption of, uh, of measures, uh, and then because also of changes of, uh, of behavior. There was a large discrepancy across regions, uh, and this was also one of the major concerns for the second wave. And in order to identify the weak aspects, we use a participatory surveillance platform. It's called in France GripNet. This is part of InfluenzaNet, um, which the London School also participated to at the, at the, um, for, for flu survey uh, in the UK. We um, changed it in the platform into COVIDNet in order to accommodate surveillance for COVID. And so using a large definition that was provided by the health, health authority in France, uh, we traced the, the and the monitored the number percentage of suspect cases and also their healthcare seeking behavior. And we found that below 40% of people who were uh, COVID compatible, uh, had COVID compatible symptoms were actually going to the doctor. And in that time frame, it was mandatory to go to the doctor and be examined in order to get eventually a prescription. A prescription. And for the cases that we had in the platform, only 50, about 50% 50 of them actually got a prescription. So there was an, a, also a, a clinical uh, triage ba uh, made by, by the general practitioner. And if we look at these data, these estimates, and we compared about the estimates of our uh, model projection, we find that of course, our estimate is much larger than what is found from biological surveillance that is CDAP, but also that if we look at the estimates from the participatory surveillance, uh, we find the same uh, uh, compatible uh, incidence value if the largest majority of cases uh, are tested. And so what we suggested at the time was to increase recommendation in order to co in communication in order to increase awareness. Uh, one of the major problem with that people were not going to, to the doctor, but also to lift the obligation to, to have a prescription to get tested, but keeping a targeted approach. Now, one of the biggest questions that we had at the time um, was if it was possible to evaluate the performance in real time. And, and I think the team were, at the end of his talk was presenting is, this really nicely, was mentioning, yes, this is a quite scalable approach, a quite rapid approach that could provide you with, with how, what under detection you have in that population at that given time. Um, and, and of course, our machinery is definitely not scalable uh, and it's definitely not rapid uh, because, well, it's, uh, it's just for collecting all the data and then fitting the model, of course, it takes time. Uh, and so we were trying to understand whether we could find some relations that, that could be a proxy for the performance. And so we looked at the detection rate as a function of the, the number of cases detected or the positivity rate, and we didn't find any association. And especially with the positivity rate, which is often used as an indicator of uh, performance of, uh, of the testing system. But this is an indicator, also the WHO mentions this as an indicator of the performance once uh, there is a systematic testing of symptomatic cases. And we were far uh, away from that situation. What we found that, that was really interesting was that uh, detection rate was uh, a power law function of the incidence. Um, and here I'm talking exclusively about symptomatic cases and so not on the tracing 
uh, of asymptomatic cases component. But what we were already seeing by region and by time was that uh, the, the detection rate was uh, dropping dramatically as soon as the incidence was slightly increasing. And one of the major problems that we had, uh, of course, in communicating this to authorities is that um, the number of tests was then increased, but it was also increased as a reaction to the increasing incidence that we had during summer. And the objectives of having about 700K tests per week uh, during these weeks were, were, uh, was, was far from being reached and we were instead testing about 200K per week. And so on one side, there is a, a clearly an importance, uh, let's say a role of the individual behavior into looking for and going to get tested at the first uh, uh, possible doubt of symptom, even if mild. And then on the other side, there needs to be a logistically and uh, in terms also of access, a system that is able uh, to provide testing and, and does not increase testing as a delayed, as a response measure to the increased incidence. So in in, in this case, uh, moving along uh, this, uh, this function, we could see where, whether, where we stand uh, depending on the incidence. Because of course, we are now asking uh, uh, once again the same question. And so this is what, what I was uh, meaning when I said, well, all over again, we are on a second national lockdown with the origin needs to, uh, to clearly get out because of uh, social and economic reasons. Um, and, and once again, the, the big question is how much we're testing now and how much we should further wait in order to, so that the lockdown brings down these numbers to a meaningful and manageable level for the testing system. And so some final thoughts, and this is really my last slides. Uh, I think that if, if we look retrospectively about this experience of, of 12 months, um, for sure, the school is one, uh, school closure is one of the big issues that is still unsolved. We still have in Europe uh, countries that have schools closed. Um, for example, uh, uh, in Italy, we still, uh, st there are still several places also in the US uh, that uh, kept the schools closed uh, uh, since, uh, uh, since the spring. I think travel ban also will probably need to relook into that as well and then somehow counter balancing benefits and economic loss induced by the travel ban induced by done by a pandemic that is circulating a pandemic so uh, so serious as this one circulating mobility i think it was uh, together with context uh, was was the superstar data set and mobility in terms of big data was probably really what pushed forward and changed the setting of how we access to this data. There, there is clearly a pre and post COVID pandemic there. And I still think that we need to learn, especially in terms of uh, interactions with the uh, uh, telephone operators and telephone companies. And I think uh, one thing that we were uh, putting in our in our commentary in our perspective is that this sort of collaboration work in urgent times uh, whenever these were already working uh, previously and they were already also including uh, uh, public health authorities and we're also including uh, um, all the regulatory frameworks so for privacy and data treatment i think on the other hand that if big data on, in this sense, in terms of mobility, worked fantastically. On the other hand, there is still probably much that we can do in terms of mobility and epidemic. There are still large points of investigation that that we are we didn't uh, go through. Um, and at this other time, uh, in many countries, there was a clear weakness of data infrastructures, uh, and we need to to be more careful into that. We need to be better prepared in the digital revolution we've been talking about for 10 years. It needs to happen. It needs also to take care of, of those data, which are small and thick and very well contextualized that we need in order to have uh, good projections. Um, then surveillance system, we didn't touch this too much, uh, but, but of course, as many other countries, we witnessed uh, a continuous change of surveillance practices that makes it extremely hard than to interpret, interpret the data. And so we need to have probably so to rethink about our surveillance systems in a more flexible way. Um, I think then 
there was a major lack of coordination and here probably I'm really thinking about a political level um, in, in terms of we, we've been talking before about importation, um, air travel, and it, it took us quite a long time in order to reach uh, um, coordination and a set of rules on how to uh, flip on and off, uh, for example, changes uh, in, at, at the borders. And the uh, Christmas period at this moment is, is already disrupting everything and every country is putting in place their own rules in terms of quarantine regulations, etc. And then I think one of the, I just barely touched upon this, uh, but communication, we know that for outbreak response, there is an important component, a huge component of communication to authorities. And of course, previous experience and especially ongoing collaboration in peacetime is what typically uh, saves the day. Uh, I think that here it was uh, put at more, uh, e even more, even more strained uh, because of the rapidity of the epidemic, because of the dramatic dramatic impact that it was having because of the biases that we know the exponential uh, uh, increase of cases that is extremely hard to grasp combined with a, an epidemic that was silently spreading so that we were not seeing up to the moment in which it was too late. And then one thing that I experienced since that more recently, especially in communication uh, to, to, to the large public and then reading also uh, the news, uh, the opening of data clearly had a huge impact on the scientific community and, and nowhere before we had such a large access to the data. Um, there is still a lot of call for opening more and more and more of this data. And somehow there is, there is this uh, uh, misunderstanding I see uh, appearing in, some, in some, some of the media that Opening the data means opening the knowledge also for, uh, for the larger uh, community. And I think that we need somehow to remark that data is, is data, but then beyond that there is still a set of tools uh, which often are extremely uh, complex and then required some uh, deep uh, um, development and understanding in order then to uh, interpret what the data is actually uh, saying, telling us. So in this very large communication to, that, that we were forced to during COVID-19 pandemic, I think that one component, at least personally I never experienced before, was communication to the general public and the lack of data culture in uh, some of the countries I, I, I got this experience in made this communication much, much harder. Uh, the simplification was somehow too, too much and, uh, and the complexity of the situation to a certain extent needs to be maintained. So I think we need also to work a lot into, into that respect. Now, thank you very much for, for your time and attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Victoria, for, for this enlightening and fantastic presentation. Yeah, I, I am sure the audience enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, we are missing the clapping, obviously, but I hope it is happening remotely in every of our homes. Um, I guess we all have witnessed this pandemic developing, and as you said, all of a sudden we have all these unthinkable measures happening. I guess we have, but in the beginning, the discussion with friends saying, oh, this is happening in China. China will never happen here, but we saw it happening, right? So, and we have accumulated a, a vast amount of data during this pandemic. So I guess it's still the big question is, are we better prepared for a break response? So, so as you said, I guess something that personally, I realized that was a missing link in the beginning is how we communicate these findings to, to, the, to the population. So I wonder is, if you have any thoughts about, for example, how, the population, the change in the population perception of these measures or something could actually change for the better or the worse, uh, the outbreak response for, for, what, for whatever is coming. Victoria, you're mute. Sorry, this, this is a very important point because, and, and one that I probably missed, in, in the sense that 
communication becomes important not only to communicate, but it becomes important because then you want, of course, population to understand what's happening and then to react appropriately to, to that to, to that recommendation. And and they found it well, as usually, you know, very, very extreme reactions. And the school is is a perfect example. In mid-April, um, then nobody really wanted the nobody was in favor of the opening of school and people were really afraid and uh, they thought that opening schools were somehow uh, taking the risk of using their kids as guinea pigs uh, uh, towards the epidemic and so we got very harsh reactions um, it, and very few people then again a few parents to send the, the the kids to school then at a certain point is I, I don't think that it's clearly really a better understanding of the epidemic but it's just a matter of a fact it's a matter of needs uh, that if you need to go to work then you want your kid of course to go to school you cannot telework easily with the, with a kid at home uh, and so just two months after at the beginning of september there was no uh, no miscommunication or a misinterpretation on that, and there was really not 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 a response, and so everybody went back uh, to school. But 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 how this was perceived across countries, uh, I, I think it's a very good indication. Some countries in Europe kept uh, pre-primary and primary schools closed. And those who are typically thought to be a good economic measure in order to allow parents to go back to work. Others instead use the more the seemingly building up epidemiological evidence that adolescents are the ones who are probably creating more trouble and more risk. And so they close the, those schools. So some of them, as soon as there is a, a situation in which additional measures need to be implemented, the schools is the first thing that they close. And I think we were discussing this morning with the NPAIs across uh, across uh, countries, um, and and I think it was Yang uh, Yang Liu who presented that, and she was showing indeed that school closure. I, I don't think we will, we will get easily out of this problem in the sense that observational studies will be hard. School closure has been often implemented together with other measures, so this entangling the the two is very hard. We need to find, for example, cases. Well, this second lockdown could be, for example, a good measure. Many countries in Europe have kept the schools open during this second lockdown. Um, so in terms of communication, I think we definitely need to, to improve into that and, and build a better culture for understanding data and understanding the science, of course. Yeah, completely on, on, on the same table on that problem. Um, so we have time for, for, for questions from the audience. Uh, I would like to remember to, to our audience that they can use the Q&A function so, so they can submit your question and can do it anonymously as they prefer. We have a, a few questions already here. Yeah, also please uh, add both the questions. So the first question is for Laida and, and she, uh, ask about the scale of, of, of the models that you are proposing. I guess you mentioned it, different scales. So I guess it was an early question. So I don't know if you want to comment on this a bit more. No, it, it, I think the scale is extremely important uh, and it really depends on your question. And the, my, it, if, I mean, going back to, to, to to what we discussed as so a tracing a, a history. Um, my history has been a history of narrowing down uh, the scale from, from global to national and then probably even a smaller scale. And, and But the reason is not only about about the tools, uh, even if we have the tools and even if we have the data, then it's a matter of questions. Uh, and for example, when I joined in CERM, it, it, it became clear to me that the interest was, of course, uh, national oriented, and so was for France. And and nowadays, working with regional health authorities, uh, it, this becomes even uh, uh, even more specific. Um, so I, I really think it, it, it's a it, it's really it's always a compromise between a question and then data needs, and probably the, the development of the model is uh, somehow the easiest part that that related to the problem. Thank you, Victoria. So we have a question by Pietro uh, about how do you, about is you fit the initial conditions in the pre-MPIs phase? Yeah, so. Yeah, so we, what we did, well, we didn't know. Uh, and so of course, what we fit was the, the growth rate. So the R uh, in the pre-pandemic, uh, let's say pre-measure pre, pre phase. Um, and then we also fitted the, the start of the epidemic. 
So we assumed that the epidemic was started with 10 infectious individuals, which is just a numerical uh, trick in order to, to let the epidemic start. And then we, we fitted the, the, the start. And in our case, for example, for the region of Ile-de-France, it is the region of Paris, most, uh, one, one of the three regions mostly hit during the first wave. We had a start at the end of January. And it was quite, quite uh, similar across, uh, across regions with, with few variations, of course and also was compatible with other estimates from other countries. Right. Uh, so th there is, a, there is a, a small follow up on the question in the same question that uh, I don't know if you are familiar for the paper, it's not then we can just, but it says is, is these conditions uh, were yeah, in agreement with, with this work that was linked there, it looks like a, also a French study. So it's not familiar. Uh, I so I don't know what is what is the link because I'm not looking at the yeah, so Milano and Al, yeah, from Epic's lab, yeah. So, but then, yeah, so we can move then. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, Toby asks, where are the most important updates needed to the Global Health Security Index, having seen the results of the current pandemic? For example, the USA was rated very well, and many Sub-Saharan African countries were poorly but the impact, the impact has been the opposite. Yes, and this is a very good, uh, good point. And it's probably something that I would put in my first point of, of revision. So do we have the good indicators? Mm -hmm. and, and, and clearly the, the reason why we witnessed that, uh, it, it was, it was not, not really in terms of the capacity and preparedness of the health system, but in terms really of the management of, uh, of the reactivity to this health system. And we saw it uh, um, also comparing countries that have a centralized approach to health to other countries who have uh, a decentralized approach to health. I'm not even, of course, getting into the political, let's say, willingness to, to, uh, to use COVID as an instrument for, uh, for uh, of course, for, let's say, for, um, to, to, build, uh, to build their, their political uh, presence. But, but truly, honestly, if you look at, even only at European countries, uh, we know that there are some of the differences, for example, between France and Italy. In Italy, the, the system is regionalized. In France, it's uh, more centralized. And I think there are good and bad uh, um, components to that, in the sense that when we are forced to do a national uh, lockdown, of course, the decentralized system is, uh, is more efficient. Uh, uh, but somehow we also looked, saw that in specific phases, uh, uh, the epidemic situations were so, so different uh, that maybe a, a closer look at a specific territory could have helped. And, and I think we don't know the answer yet. I think we need, uh, we still need to do, to do some work into that perspective to, to understand what could have been better in terms of management. But the, the specific, uh, let's say going back to the question, I think uh, what, what it, points out uh, is that uh, we forget somehow that some of the indicators are really in, on the management and not exclusively on the preparedness of the system. So a system can be prepared, but then decisions need to be taken and decisions can be taken in a different way in different countries for, for different reasons. Um, and then Africa is probably different context uh, uh, again, and not only for, for the preparedness, but also for the specific uh, situation of, uh, of the country. But if we compare Western countries, I think we, we see a, a Europe to, to US, a stark contrast in the way the epidemic has been, uh, has been um, managed. And, and definitely we need to investigate that better and also to see what are the weak points and what we could improve. Thank you, Victoria. So Sophia is asking, it's also related with the, the point I raised originally. So what's the role of science? Was the role of science communication communication and not exploited in the dialogue with the public opinion? So. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So what we realized that very early on, because uh, as I was saying, a very simple study on, um, on, the, on the risk of importation, was politicized in both directions. And we had also um, investigations at, well, investigation, I don't, I don't know exactly how to translate that, but um, uh, well, we were yeah, called at the, 
uh, Senate and the Assembly uh, at the Parliament in order to discuss uh, uh, also those results because uh, they were somehow so crucial for, they were interpreted to be so crucial for the initial handling of, uh, and the initial understanding of the danger of the situation. Um, and, and then of course, yes, in some sense, uh, uh, there were there were some some declarations, for example, that uh, science couldn't predict a second wave, uh, and and I think that there once again, uh, and it's not our paper, it's plenty of papers and studies that show that, that this was a clear possibility, even very early on. Um, so I, I think that this is. Uh, uh, clearly one of uh, the possible uh, uh, side effect of uh, using science at communication. And one of the strategy, I think, uh, that is what, what we did and is also what you did at the center to make everything publicly available. So that once it is known, once we reach that level of knowledge at that moment uh, is out there and then can be traced back and put in context within that date of publication. But I think that the most important thing was is, is really to put it out there and then communicate it clearly, make it available to everybody so that there is no misunderstanding of what science was saying at a specific moment. Thank you, Victoria. So the next question is by James. With regard to reopening schools, have you been able to see an effect from schools which provide in a school teaching for half the studying population on alternate days compared to those who had full class sizes? Um, we didn't because specifically for France, we didn't have a situation in which uh, some of the schools went back uh, completely to, uh, to, to in class teaching and some of them stayed at home or alternated. We provided, we suggested uh, as a mean to, for, for especially for high schools, uh, alternation and uh, with partial attendance, uh, but then this really didn't happen. And I, I need to also specify that during um, after the first wave, uh, high schools uh, were were kept closed in those regions that were mostly hit by the first wave. Um, and we had to reach uh, a lower level of uh, epidemic activity for them to reopen. So effectively they reopened only the last two weeks. Um, so we don't have a situation, we don't have, uh, this was never experienced uh, in our country, so we didn't run uh, this study. What we're seeing now currently um, with, with the second wave, in which all school levels are open during, uh, uh, despite the lockdown, we are currently testing several uh, high schools and we are finding uh, quite low uh, number of cases. Uh, even lower than, than expectations. So, so this is one, one of the good news, uh, I think, that we can provide. But these are um, not even preliminary results. It's just the numbers <laughs> that we looked at just, uh, just yesterday. So I cannot elaborate more on that. Yeah. Many thanks, Victoria. So the, the, the next one is a kind of big question and also copying it to the chat for you. For this experience, would you recommend a higher coordination at national or international scales to enhance collaboration between the modeling community and be better prepared to face future pandemics? So improving our reactivity, our ability to cope with few initial data, the amount of question scenarios that can be addressed, etc. As you said, developing a useful model as well as looking properly at data takes time. The more people, the better. Yes, and I think uh, I, I, I totally agree. I think that uh, I, I must say, I think the scientific community did that during this pandemic. And this was also thanks to the fact that data was available for everybody, um, of course, to a certain extent, but it was out there, open. And so this was truly the very first pandemic or large epidemic uh, of worldwide interest that we witnessed in which every group could decide to start working on it and, and really had the data needed to, to do that. And, and the outcome, of course, is that we were able to have a lot of diverse perspective on how to handle this pandemic. And I think it's extremely beneficial. Um, also, a lot of scientific groups were coordinated uh, across the world, either, for example, by WHO or ECDC, the CDC in the US. So a lot of uh, 
networks already existed or were built very, very fast uh, in order to have a continuous, uh, for example, weekly communication uh, across modelers. So I think that in terms of scientific community, uh, this is quite strong. Uh, probably what we need to improve is instead more at a political level. And, uh, and, and now, of, of course, this is a very, uh, let's say, European tackle uh, and, and perspective, but I think uh, what we are really missing is, is that. And, and there are papers, even uh, daily papers, one of uh, the paper, uh, my, the, one of the very early work that I did, there was the one on the pandemic that I mentioned. And there, for example, we saw that it was for a pandemic flu, we had antivirals, and we saw the usual situation in which you have few countries having resources at disposal, and then you want to solve a global problem. And with, with numerical simulations, you can easily show that you need to solve the global problem by globally somehow redistributing these resources. And of course, this doesn't work exclusively for antivirals and pandemic flu, it works also for this situation as well. Um, another paper during uh, by, by the World Pop uh, uh, project, for example, showed during summer that uh, not coordinating the reopening of the borders and of lockdown could have led uh, to longer epidemics in specific countries. And there, again, um, I, I think is an important perspective that we need to take into account and somehow we need to find a regulatory framework that could allow to be to, to have more cooperative, uh, more cooperative approach. Thank you, Victoria. So this is probably the last question given to, to time constraints. So it's a question by Peter. To one extent, do cultural factors, for example, the, the cafe culture in France, so in France and Italy, but not in Sweden, play a role in transmission? This may vary between countries and across countries. So I guess it relates with how we actually collect and use behavioral data, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this is one of the limits, of course, of, uh, of uh, our concept matrices is that uh, we uh, somehow we are not uh, accounting also for, for this aspect or, or in a limited way. Um, and, and restaurants and cafe and the fact to spend a lot amount of time every day. I mean, this is part of, of French life. And this is also why it's been particularly um, hurting uh, to, to close uh, these, uh, these businesses, not only from an economic point of view, but really from a social aspect point of view. Um, and nonetheless, what we're seeing now is that even with, uh, with all of this close and even with having a sort of partial or milder lockdown at the moment, uh, uh, we're not able to bring down the epidemic activity below, below the levels that we would like to achieve. Uh, so clearly winter is a tough, uh, uh, is a tough game and uh, we saw that in uh, in other countries uh, that were in the southern hemisphere uh, when when we were in the spring and and and, and so this is one of, of the big problems uh, culturally a lot of a lot of these aspects count uh, it's uh, it's not only how we spend our time but also how our for example, household is um, is organized, whether it is uh, single parent, multiple parents, multiple generations, uh, uh, whether the, the typical household size is larger or smaller, uh, typical activities during Sundays. Uh, um, so all of this, and, and once again, during Christmas, Christmas time is one other moment in which, of course, the, all of this is, is coming into play. Conversation is all about what are we going to be able to do during Christmas time. And I mean, we, we cannot, um, we, we simply cannot avoid that and we simply cannot uh, neglect that these are aspects uh, which uh, affect everybody's and we, and, and we need to, to consider them. Yeah, so let's see how perception changed with all these restrictions happening over Christmas time. Yeah, so Victoria, we owe you a special vote of thanks for being here remotely because we know you are very, very busy leading COVID research at the moment. So we really appreciate as a center, yeah, so you sharing this space with us. So please, I said my more sincere thanks. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks to you, thanks you. Thank, thank you, you very you much. Thank you. Uh, and, and finally, I also like to extend my thanks to our audience as well. Uh, we appreciate your attention and your engagement with the questions. And we hope you join us for our monthly seminars and our annual lecture next year.
yeah thank you so much everyone yeah